Here we go. Doors are open. People can come and join us now. Hi, Linda and Rich. Katie, awesome. People are joining. I am going to go ahead and drop a couple of links in the chat for all of you to check out. Um, the links are to purchase the book because if you haven't done so, you should probably go do that. And we'll give everybody a couple of minutes to come in and get settled and situated. Okay, and my side I am it's frozen. I am, um, Dr. Jeff, we can still see you and hear you. One disabled? Oh, yeah, you oh. are frozen. Yeah, you are frozen. Just like that. So we'll get we'll give Dr. Jelks a couple minutes to see if maybe he can maybe try logging in and logging back on. Um, sometimes that helps. Or um, you can also stop your video and restart it. And see if that helps. Nancy saying that she can't hear us. Jennifer, can you still hear me? I can. Okay. I can. Oh, there you go. Wait. Perfect. So we get rid of the Let's see if I can. I'm going to try to spotlight. There we go. Yay! Dr. Jelks, can you hear us okay now? Yes, I can. Okay, perfect. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for stopping by and joining us. Um, this evening, we have Dr. Randall Jelks joining us in conversation with Jennifer Moss. Uh, they will be discussing Letters to Martin, Meditations on Democracy in Black America. And we're so excited. Dr. Jelks has been a long time friend of the Schuler Books family, and we're just so excited to have him joining this evening. If you haven't already purchased um, your copy of Letters to Martin, you can do so at the links that I've dropped in the chat. That also gives you an opportunity to familiarize yourself with um, using the chat because this evening, if you have any questions, Dr. Jelks would be happy to answer them. Um, and you can drop those in the chat or in the Q&A. You'll see the little toggle at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, and we will get to those towards the end of the, the session. So um, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our conversationalist, Jennifer Moss, uh, local host of NPR's Morning Edition at WGBU-FM is an award-winning broadcast news journalist with more than two decades of professional television news experience, including the nation's fifth largest news market. She's worked as both news reporter and news anchor for television and radio in markets from Grand Rapids and Kalamazoo, all the way to San Francisco, California. Jennifer, thanks so much for joining us tonight. It is a pleasure to be here. I'm very excited and congratulations, Dr. Jelks. What an exciting day. Thank you, thank you. Wonderful. And so without further ado, Dr. <laughs> Randall Jelts is a professor of African and African American Studies and American Studies at the University of Kansas. He is the author of two award winning books, African African Americans in the Furniture City, <clears throat> The Struggle for Civil Rights, Struggle in Grand Rapids, and Benjamin Elijah Mays, Schoolmaster of the Movement, a biography, as well as Faith and Struggle in the Lives of Four African Americans, Ethel Waters, Mary Lou Williams, Eldridge Cleaver, and Muhammad Ali. Jokes has recently contributed to a collection of essays titled 42 Today, Jack Robinson and His Legacy, edited by Michael Long. His writings have appeared in the Boston Review, the Los Angeles Review of Books, as well as blogs, journals, newspapers, and periodicals. He's the co-editor of the academic journal, American Studies, Jelks serves as the executive producer for a documentary film, I To Sing America, Langston Hughes' Unfurled, directed by Kevin Wilmot, the 2019 Academy Award co-winner for Best Screenplay Adaption, Black KK Klansman. Thank you so much, Dr. Jelks, for joining us. Thank you. All right, I'm, I'm, going, to be here. I am going to disappear and let you guys have your wonderful conversation and I'll come back at the end for questions. Okay, thank you. I wanna say again, Dr. Jones, it's a pleasure to be here to talk about your 
book launch. Um, and of course, we're just days, less than a week away from Dr. Martin Luther King, from the holiday for Dr. Martin Luther King. So this, of course, is very fitting. Um, again, congratulations to you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm happy. I'm, I'm always happy when a book comes out. <laughs> Absolutely. I bet you are. So this yeah. is fun. This oh, is the closest yeah. that, as a man, I have come to birthing children. This is, <laughs> it was like, yay. <laughs> It's a wonderful thing. Yeah. So your book, Letters to Martin, Meditations on Democracy and Black America, was written, some say, evoking uh, Dr. King's letter from the Birmingham jail. You're, you're writing letters to Dr. King, looking at democracy and the struggles therein. And, and so let's start with the basics. Did all of this um, come about as, your as a result of your speech at Elmhurst College to the students there uh, for them to know the struggle to live democratically is lifelong, or perhaps was it something that was kind of just stirring inside of you for some kind of message or a conversation you wanted to have? Well, you know, I mean, the, first of all, I got invited by uh, the um, uh, the school uh, to speak on Martin Luther King Day uh, on tw in 2017, just right after uh, President, uh, former President Trump was uh, inaugurated. And um, and I wanted to uh, say uh, to the students, uh, many who seemed upset, I wanted to, I did a little homework about what the student body was feeling at the time. And I wanted to uh, go in with something positive that uh, democracy is something to, that we always struggle uh, to have always struggle at, at the table. And so I, I approached this like the letter to, uh, to uh, Birmingham jail in, in the Birmingham jail, I approached it as, uh, well, I'm gonna write a letter to the students and and and, and talk to them in, in that form. And it uh, students really appreciated that. And, and I said, well, that's a good idea. Maybe I should do this even further. And so yeah. I extended it to, 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 toward writing a book because I thought it allowed us to step back, uh, take a step back and, and, and reflect and pause. That's why it's called a meditation. Meditation, absolutely, because it's a, it's a murmur to, to really concentrate and to look at that. So, so how do these meditations, these letters, uh, impact or, or perhaps reflect how you're dealing with or have dealt with democratic struggles and your spirituality? Could you talk about that in the book, um, especially during the current climate in the United States? Yeah, well, one of the things that I was reflecting on is that uh, being democratic is not simply procedural, right? I mean, we have laws and we should have laws. Uh, and, and, you know, from being a reporter, you focus on what's happening in the state legislature or the mayor seat. But there also is a side of democracy that is a, an emotional and uh, I would dare say a spiritual commitment uh, that you want to live uh, giving people dignity, uh, all people dignity, and and that's missing in our culture today. Um, I I think they're, they're just simply uh, people gaming and power, but not really uh, making the commitment to democracy itself. It's to the political machinations, it's to interests, but not a commitment to democracy itself. And that's where the emotional, spiritual power comes in. And I grew up, um, like so many people in my generation, as a boomer uh, in the South, uh, in New Orleans, uh, where religious faith uh, is an important thing. I mean, I guess in a city where you don't bury people um, uh, below, <laughs> below ground, everybody's really buried above ground, uh, you have to think about the matters of life and death, even on, early on as a child, walking past a cemetery to go to school. Uh, so there is something really important and spiritual about uh, our, our lives, not just uh, the material and, uh, and the, consu uh, uh, the consumer base of our lives. So, and, and as we go a little step further on, on the spirituality piece of it, you, you also talk a lot about hope. Um, and about that spirituality. And as people engage in, in democratic struggles and whatnot, is hope really the center or core um, of this book? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, uh, again, um, my, my, my ancestors, uh, 
uh, all came to Louisiana in all kinds of different uh, forms. I'm very, um, one set of ancestors was sold by Georgetown University into Louisiana. Uh, others, a set of in, uh, ancestors were brought down from uh, Virgin into uh, from Virginia into Louisiana, as they said in, in the times of slavery, sold down the river. Um, others came uh, via the French as the Haitian Revolution began on the island of Haiti. So uh, these people all uh, maintained through a life of it. They had to endure, man. They had to endure uh, slavery, and then they had to endure. Uh, 90 years of Jim Crow. I remember my grandparents uh, voting for the first time in 1965 after the Vote Rights Act. Um, so they maintained a hope and they maintained a hope that, you know, their grandchildren would go to college. They, they maintained a hope that their um, um, uh, uh, friends and neighbors uh, would have a, a decent wage. Uh, so that hope is really at the core of much of what we call, quote unquote, the Black experience. Because sometimes it's not tangible realities, but it is a hope and aspiration. And that's that's what I wanted to convey. And, yeah, to continue to do that. And, and I want to talk a couple specifics uh, in a couple of chapters. Uh, so in the first chapter, uh, Network of Mutuality, you mentioned Dr. King's sermon, uh, Remaining Woke Through a Great Revolution. Um, and you mentioned now young people use that phrase, stay woke, um, without really knowing perhaps where it came from. Do you think that the letters, your meditations, will provide an opportunity for young people reading this uh, to become, or in some cases, stay woke, as they say? Yeah, I, I, I'm with them. They should stay woke. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see that as a pejorative at all. I think they should understand what's going on in the world. And they should go understand what's going on in their political uh, realities. Uh, so yes, stay woke is a good term. And King used that to Morehouse graduate. He spoke that to Morehouse graduates. And he said, look, we could become like Rip Van Winkle and, and sleep through a great revolution and not know that there's change. So I say, um, it's a good thing that they stay woke. And that's one of the things I, I thought about, uh, that he was intentionally asking young people uh, uh, not to be mean-spirited, mm -hmm. but to be aware that of uh, what's going on all, in all the worlds around them. I found it interesting, and I never knew that he had that sermon remaining woke. And since that is one of the catchphrases these days, I just, the, you know, the parallels of Dr. King it's just amazing when you look at some of the history and the things that he said and the things that are happening now and just, just how they all come together, which of course is, is what you're doing with, with the book. Um, so looking at chapter two, then the highest ethical ideal, you talk about King being kind of thrust into the globally televised boycott in Montgomery. And in your writing, you said, um, Black Montgomery demonstrated to the world the kind of democratic valor we continually need. And you said the, the bus boycott there teaches us that democracy is a life discipline first. Would you say that perhaps for today's protesters, democracy is a, is a life discipline first? Are people learning from Dr. King? Oh, I think so. I mean, I think the uh, Black Lives Matter uh, is a, is is a kind of decentering. It was local uh, and lo different cities, uh, different kinds of leadership. I think absolutely they, they've learned uh, from Dr. King, uh, even if they don't know they've learned uh, from, from Dr. King, because Montgomery was uh, a local struggle. And Montgomery, the people of Montgomery uh, ran their meetings like Robert's Rules of Order, and they voted when they had to make um, they uh, make changes, and and the leadership brought the issues to to the people. So it was a highly democratic uh, protest, and and that's a wonderful thing, and we take it for granted. Yeah, yeah. So in a in a revolution of values, you also you talk about King's description of the giant triplets of racism, materialism, and and militarism, or the holy trinity of of U.S. governance. And King called for a revolution of values. You mentioned later that uh, revolution of values, like his phrase, content of our character, can easily be muddled, twisted, 
kind of to uphold the status quo. Is our nation, in your opinion, in any way considering or moving toward a revolution of values or renewing of the mind, as you were talking about? Uh, no, I, I mean, that's why I, I wrote it. I don't. That's I, what I thought. I don't. <laughs> I bring don't that to the point, so. right? <laughs> I don't. I don't think so at all. I, I think that the the uh, that society is that we're not taking the time to step back and reflect. We're not taking the time to uh, think about what is it that we really want to uh, promote, uh, what we, what, what's been going on in our society uh, among um, not all news media, but the, the kind of major networks. It's, it's yelling at each other. I mean, uh, it's, everything seems like sports radio to me uh, when a guy calls in and says, yeah, yeah, yeah. But the re re real revolution of values is to think about uh, what we're doing, think about what the laws we're putting down, um, be considerate, uh, and, and not in simply what, what people in West Michigan say, West Michigan nice, but being considerate means being having some a, a considered judgment why you are for something or why you're against something without yelling. In. And maybe we will disagree. And maybe we'll have to negotiate that out, but that is done with respect and mutuality. Yes, absolutely. And so um, looking at, at chapter two, the high ideals, Dr. King's high ideals, it reminds you that the social order we desire is one at peace itself. You call it our highest ethical ideal. And as you reflect on these, and you were kind of talking about that, that mutual that respect, um, as you reflect on these meditations and, and look at our world today, are we moving in a I mean, in a direction at all for our social order? Or is well, that no, back to what you were saying a moment yeah, ago? No, no. I, I think human beings have never moved in that. Uh, I think that we attempt to, uh, and we always, that's why it's a struggle. Dem being democratic is a struggle because we're always attempting to, and people are always uh, individuals, groups always want to gain the, the system to their advantage. I mean, so it's always a, a, a struggle, but that you, you have, my grandfather used to say, you know, you don't stand for something, you, you're gonna fall for anything. And I, I, I think that's the ideals. You have to have some cutoff point uh, for what you, you, you will do in life. Um, and that's really, really important. Uh, and that's the ideals. And, and King's idea was that the United States wasn't an inclusive society. Um, while we can honor George Washington, we must admit that George Washington was a slave owner and that women and people enslaved were not a part of the country. Uh, and if you didn't own property, you weren't a part of the country. You didn't have a right to participate in the, the political process, that, which meant you didn't have a right to say anything about what would happen to you. Martin Luther King is radically democratic because he says, we are all God's children and we all deserve, deserve to be, to be. And we all yeah. deserve to be protected by laws. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A lighter hearted question here. So much goes into writing a book. Um, especially when you're dealing with so many historical references, and I know that's what you do. Um, but your music selection, your quotes are amazingly succinct, filled with, you know, such a connection to your thoughts and to the words. How did you find, you know, I'm always like curious, those just an oddball question, but those particular songs to quote from, from old school to new, was that part of the emotion and feeling that came from writing this series of letters and meditations as you know, like writing to Dr. King? I mean, how did you come upon uh, some of those particular songs? Because they correlate very well with, you know, at the beginning of every chapter, what you're, what you're talking about. Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still a, a, a kid at heart and I'm still listening to all kinds of music. Uh, I can think of my son when he was, uh, uh, 13 years old, he took me around New York to a hip hop tour. So I, I visited every uh, spot and he said, well, that's where Nas was born, dad. And that's what this one was. <laughs> and so I-, I That's your I, first hand tour there. Right, that's right. I got a first hand uh, tour. Uh, one of my friends who lives in New York 
who works in city government said, uh, I've learned something from a 13 year old that I never knew about myself. <laughs> but, but music, I'm a child of New Orleans and where you walk down the street and you hear music being played and jukeboxes being played. And you know it is totally different than Grand Rapids uh, in that it's really, really cultured. I, um, <laughs> and I love Grand Rapids, don't mind you, yeah. but New Orleans is very cultured. And so I heard from classical music to, to the blues. And so music has always been a part of how I connect with students. That's one of the first questions I always ask. So what do you listen to? And they always want to give me a nice version. And I was like, no, what do you really listen to? What do you really listen to, <laughs> right? Yeah, what do you really listen to? And so uh, it, 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 it connects. And, and I because I uh, love music, all kinds of music, I even served on the symphony board here uh, at one time, that, that I wanted to connect this to, to music. And I really bore, borrowed from uh, the great scholar, W.E.B. Du Bois and Souls of Black Folks said that at the beginning of all of um, uh, that, uh, th those essays in Souls of Black Folks, he has, he then had hymns uh, at, at, at the time uh, in musical lines. And I thought, oh yeah, you know, that's a way of, of connecting it. But I wanted more contemporary. Du Bois would not have appreciated <laughs> Some of you are <laughs> referencing. <laughs> so I wanted Maybe both not. hymns and the blues and hip hop and and so forth. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that was that was that's good. Um, so in speaking some of that emotion, let's talk about you writing this book. You're taking current day democratic issues, the struggle that you compare to Dr. King's day, and you write these these letters, these meditations to Dr. King. How emotional was that? And maybe perhaps it wasn't. I don't know, but I would think because I'm as I read it, how emotional was this experience? It's historical, but it's heartfelt. What was it like to kind of delve in and jump into this and, and write this? Once you figured out at Elmhurst, you know, this is how I want to proceed with this particular book. What was that like? Well, you know, it, it takes you uh, down uh, memory lane for me. So uh, again, dating myself, I was born in 56 uh, when Dr. King um, was assassinated. I was 11 years old. Um, I have a late uh, birthday at the end of September. So I was 11 years old and um, and I went back, I was still in the South then. And I went back to what my teachers had said that day, how my mother felt that day. Um, and I, you know, uh, just kind of did some remembering and, and charting out uh, all those things and, and what I, I will say is that the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. for me uh, as an individual was the, it sort of forced me to come to sort of political consciousness very early. Um, I start reading about uh, um, more uh, uh, in, uh, going back and reading about the Seven Day War in 1967, the Israelis and the Palestinians uh, I started understanding the, the war in Vietnam because I had first cousins, um, older first cousins who were in that war. And so all of those things started to come together and it became a way of understanding the world. So for me, uh, yeah, it was very, very moving. And I was trying to be, because I, I, I wrote this for a generation that it, the millennials, the Gen Zs, and whoever, whatever else group we have after them, that uh, for for them to know that this is a this was honest wrestling uh, with this, and they don't often see um, boomers doing doing that in a way that reaches to them. And I wanted to reach to them and move them. Okay, and so you took it from square one from Elmhurst all the way through, and and really kind of connected your own personal history to. The, the correlation of, of Dr. King and all of the things that, that he said and talked about. Um, I want to remind everyone to make sure if you have any questions, um, I've got a couple more questions, but um, in the chat or the question and answer section, if you'd like to submit a question for Dr. Delks, please do so. And, and we can have that conversation shortly. Um, I want to talk about chapter uh, 10, Growing Up King. I want to have a little setup here. So 
you write about there was trauma for those, as you mentioned, living as the children of the civil rights generation. You talked about witnessing that volcanic overflow of a violently changing society and, and the number of things from the era, including, you know, eventually having the, the Dr. King holiday. But you talk about King's political commitment, liberating the people you love. Uh, you stated too many who grew up in King's shadow believe that they could bypass full political commitments. And, and for the end of that um, particular chapter, you state the lesson learned is that we are all responsible for facing and recalibrating our political realities. And you offer Dr. King's commitment. He has a long list of things that he's like, if I did this and that, um, and, and he notes that this is how democracy stays alive. As you reflect on your writings in this book, as we were just talking about how emotional and, and what you put into it, your letters to Dr. King and your thought process, do you think democracy will stay alive? Well, it's always a, a tricky thing. Historically, uh, being a historian, I know that um, democracies come and go. Um, my, my hope is, uh, that's why I want to, I wrote this book. My hope is that we keep it alive. Uh, that uh, it's still, in my opinion, monarchies are, are pretty iffy. Um, you get one good king, and then you get you get fifty years of bad monarchs. Uh, so I I rather stick with mediocre presidents at times and great presidents that we choose. Uh, uh, and uh, I I would rather see a system that we choose uh, uh, to to create, uh, not to overwhelm us and not to be based in race or anything like that. That we choose and that we work together uh, to argue about. Just like I, uh, you know, the city of Grand Rapids is going to have a new police chief. Everybody should go out and listen to what these people have to say. They'll be in charge of a, of an important aspect of government. Will will they say, you know, I'm also for people communities helping to police themselves, uh, not just the kind of old fashioned policing where we just sort of like drive in um, like the old television show Dragnet or, you know, Adam 12 in a car and pull up. Uh, but rather that having conversations, what's the best way to police our own selves and our own neighbors? Because that's what the meaning of self-governance means, is to, to be able to participate in our own governance of ourselves. Mm -hmm. and, and so you wrote the letters uh, to Dr. King, meditated on that history in present day. Looking at Dr. King's legacy then as, as we approach um, his holiday coming up next week and to help us, to help folks navigate and or empower Blacks for democratic struggles of this day, that's, that's your message? Yeah, partly that's my message. First of all, uh, Dr. King, um, that holiday represents not just Martin Luther King Jr. And I, I really wanna say it represents all the people, the unsung, in the sung people uh, um, who participated in, in, in the struggle to make the United States more fully de democratic. It, uh, I always like Martin Luther King's Nobel Prize acceptance speech. He says, I accept this on behalf of, you know, millions of people, millions of black people in the South, Negroes as the, the, the nomenclature was then. And I, I accept that on the behalf and knowing um, a little bit about uh, his life, uh, he knew that there were other leaders, there were other important voices, voices that differed in his own. So that this Martin Luther King Day is about all those people too. It's not just about the individual. Although, you know, uh, Coretta Scott King advocated that. What she had in mind is that Rosa Parks is as much as that day Fannie Lou Hamer is as much a part of that day. The great lawyer, Pauli Murray, is as much a part of that day. Uh, we, King Day represents um, all of us and all the men and the women. And you remember the civil rights movement went off with teens and children. Um, we forget in Birmingham, the Children's March, that everybody got to participate. What more? What more democratic that, could that, that, that be? Uh, and we need to highlight that. That's really democratic. 
the kids that went to jail just like their parents went to jail uh, in, in a struggle for to make the country better. Are you excited about the, the prospects of your book reaching people and getting that message out? I mean, it's got to be an exciting thing to be an author of such a book to, you know, encourage involvement and a democratic process. Well, yes, I'm hoping that it engages a conversation. Mm -hmm. I am in academic circles all the time and I hear, you know, these highbrow theorists talk about democracy and, and I think, you know, you know, real democracy came from sort of black proletariat working folks um, who went to church on Sunday and who or went to the bars on Saturday, but whatever they did, they understood that, that uh, something important needed to happen and occur to make it a more expansive country for all of us. We forget the United States is so diverse today because of the 1965 Immigration Act, which was uh, led by uh, Senator Hart out of Michigan. Um, it was a civil piece of civil rights uh, legislation. Uh, and that that all countries were welcome uh, to the United States. Not it used to be just Northern European uh, was highlighted uh, by the 1924 Immigration Act. Now we could see people from Asia, uh, uh, the African countries, all of the A Asian countries. Now we could see people from a, a variety of places uh, forming the United States, and, and it changed the whole census pattern. So that those are great things. And we forget that those came out of the protests of, of people who were protesting uh, segregation on buses, but also segregation on immigration. And this, this is, this is what, what's so important. Okay, and your book calling attention to all of that. And now we're so excited for you. And again, congratulations on your launch. We're going to go to Samantha. Samantha, do you have uh, any questions for us from the audience? I do. I do. I do. I have one from Michael. Good evening, Michael. Uh, Randall, a question from your former Ottawa Hills neighbors. How do you <laughs> think Dr. King would fare in these post-January 6th political times? What would he be doing, saying, and organizing? Well, I mean, like everyone else, he would be shocked, right? Uh, uh, one, um, the march on Washington where, um, you know, 300,000 people gathered uh, went on without incident. Uh, it was respectful. Uh, it was in front of the Lincoln Memorial. Uh, he, uh, so I'm sure he would be shocked like it. But he also warned us of, of the kind of corrosive uh, part of cynicism taking place in American democracy. One of his famous talks given at Riverside Church was called Beyond Vietnam. And he was pointing to, uh, um, he was pointing to not just the Vietnam War, which he was criti critical of, but the corrosive effect that uh, cynical politics might have in American life. And, and uh, January 6th proved that. And tell Mike hi. <laughs> Perfect. Um, what are you currently reading? Oh boy, uh, I, <laughs> I read everything. Um, let me see. What am I currently reading? Um, a big fat novel by uh, 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 a friend and a colleague, uh, Honoré Jeffers, called the uh, Songs Songs of W. E. B. Du Bois. It's a big fat novel. Um, I'm reading. Um, I'm reading a lot of, of fiction because I, I read so much academic stuff because I edit an academic journal. So I try to uh, read a lot of lot of fiction. Um, um, and um, uh, I'm, I'm waiting for my friend. I have a, I have these friends who are novelists, Tyree Jones, to come out with a new novel because she makes me laugh and and weep at the same time. So. Um, and so, um, novels that primarily is what I'm, I'm trying to read, um, but I'm always stuck with some, some history that here and there. Um, yeah, I just finished a big fat book on uh, Africa and the making of the modern world by Howard French. So, yeah. 
staying busy. Um, well, and then well, what's next for you? What do you got coming down the line? Well, I got coming down the line, uh, I, I, crazy enough, when I went to the University of Kansas, uh, I, I met filmmakers. Uh, my colleague, Kevin Wilmot, and I are working on uh, a documentary on the poet Langston Hughes. And I'm going to write a small book on Langston Hughes, uh, I hope to accompany uh, the documentary. And then I'm working on another documentary with one of my other colleagues, uh, Bob Erst. Um, and, and so uh, I've gotten into this documentary film world. Uh, uh, and uh, so I, I really enjoy it. And I figure there has to be more voices than Ken Burns or Stanley Nelson. So I really have enjoyed being on that side of learning how to be a producer of these things. That's got to be fun for you. That's got to oh, be fun is. delving into something different, a little different. Uh, oh aspect. yeah, it's it, it's we different form of storytelling. Yeah, absolutely. Because you have to. Well, you're from television world. You, <laughs> it, it's really for me. I mean, I you know long words, but you have to show things in film and uh, in ways that you can't do uh, with writing. So it's it is a it's challenging and and the challenge of filmmaking is raising money <laughs> absolutely absolutely but it, it does tweak your your creative side i mean it yes. allows you to do some other types of creativity yes. i mean writing is one but then when you have to write the pictures and make it all fit yeah yeah, yeah. And I, I these days i'm going to try my hand at a novel good for you yeah. so what's your um i'm going to ask if anybody has any other questions we probably got one or two more questions on our end and then um, we'll probably wrap things up. So feel free to drop your questions in the chat or the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Um, so what is your process when you sat down to write um, this particular book? What was your process in compiling your information? Well, when I write period is I ch give myself a word limit a day of 150 words. Now, people say that's a paragraph. Some days <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's, it's hard to get a paragraph out and so I try to give myself 150 words some days I I'm just you know flowing going through it uh and then some days it's like I'm at 139 can I make it 11 more words <laughs> so I I try to do it steady and I try to explain to my students it's better to do a little bit at a time than try to do you know, like I'm going to take all of Saturday and write you won't you know, you'll wind up wanting to do something else. So I try to do it steadily in uh, in the morning um, uh, after I come from the gym. Like I try to put that put that in the, the the same context as the gym. Do your writing, and then I prep for prep for class. How long does it take? I, mean, I just want to jump in real quick, Samantha. How long then does it take to write? It looks like if you're writing 150 words, if you that's your Process. Yeah, well, if you know, I mean, some days it's better than others. I mean, you, you actually go past, I mean, you know, I may write two or three pages, but some days it's, it's yeah, just, uh, yeah, so I, I try to make it realistic and, and small bite size and, and, uh, and steady doing it steadily. And, and soon enough, you know, you'll have, it may not be the greatest draft, but you'll have a draft, you know, and the art of writing is rewriting. You know, you go back and read with your own and you go, oh boy, that sucks. Start <laughs> over. <laughs> oh, well, but there's a gem in there. There's a gem of a paragraph or whatever. And, you know, you keep plugging away at it. Awesome. And um, we have a question from Jennifer Morrison. Hi, Jennifer. Um, I recently read that most of our productive years are between the ages of 60 and 80. Are you finding that true for yourself? And how do you find time to do all that you are doing? Um, I'm crazy. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I just think you get up in the morning and you try to uh, do the things you, you're doing. I've always uh, tried to multitask, uh, sometimes successfully, sometimes unsuccessfully, you know, but uh, I think that uh, you make room for what you want, you know, um, you make room for the things you uh, uh, desire, you know, and um, uh, I, my spouse, my children, they all are quite busy people. So, 
you know, I, 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 we just live in a busy household uh, and catch each other uh, as we see each other and make time and make appointments with each other now. <laughs> Isn't that yeah, fun cool. how that happens? It yeah. is. Totally. <laughs> Great. So uh, Dr. Jeltz, I know you have a busy calendar um, in the upcoming weeks. Is there any other places that people could catch you in the next couple of days? Oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm doing, um, uh, Grand Rapids has a wonderful book community and, you know, um, and, and I, I go way back with Schuler's. So I even work for Schuler's uh, and, and so forth. Uh, but I will uh, do a book talk virtual like this in Detroit. Uh, at uh, Source Booksellers. And then I will do a pub, two public events, um, one at We Are Lit, uh, GR, and with the, at the African American, uh, Grand Rapids African American Museum, uh, Books and Mortar on Sunday, another public event. Uh, then I will be in, back in Lawrence and uh, with my friend Kevin Wilmot, uh, we'll do a virtual talk uh, for the Raven Bookstore and uh, I'm all the way into February uh, in DC, uh, uh, virtual uh, busboys and poets, uh, novel books in Memphis. Um, so it's really, it, it really is uh, uh, quite- So you're not busy at all is what you're telling oh, us. You've got, <laughs> got plenty of time to that. do all of the things. <laughs> I got to teach, in, in addition, I have to teach, on, teach as well. You're making me tired. I know, I know. <laughs> yeah. Right, Dr. Jocks, where do people find this information if they want to check you out? Uh, you can randallmauricejelks.com. Um, you can always just uh, Google me too, um, you know, uh, and um, uh, at, at the University of Kansas as well. So I'm, I'm easily, easy to find. Wonderful. Well, I want to thank both of you for joining us this evening. This has been wonderful. It's been wonderful to hear you both talk. Um, this was our first event of the year, so I'm excited for that. It's just great. Um, and thank you, everyone that tuned in to watch. Don't forget to grab your copy of Dr. Jelks's new book, Letters to Martin. Um, I dropped links to that, but you can always go search those on schulerbooks.com and nicholasbooks.com as well. Well, thank you I, so signed, much. I signed books at the store today. Uh... Uh, at the um, uh, 28th Street store. I went in. Perfect. And they didn't tell me, but that's <laughs> fantastic. I'm glad. So get your books. You can come head to over to Shane. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll catch you, Jennifer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just playing. I'm just playing. It's been a wonderful conversation. Congratulations again. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer, for willing to host this. I really greatly appreciate it. And I greatly appreciate Schuler's in Elancy or oh, Okamas, uh, and and also uh, Nicola books because they've been always wonderful to me. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you both so much. You can't hear the claps. I'll clap for you. Have a Thank wonderful you. nice night, everyone, and we will see you next time. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye.